Uh, okay, uh, Ambassador Reddy, I think you can get going now. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a, a fascinating lecture for you today, and it's my privilege to welcome you all on behalf of the Deccan Heritage Foundation, the Cambridge Center for Islamic Studies, and the Bangalore International Center to present this latest in our series of online lectures. It has a wonderful title. It's called Eclipsed by the Moon, Mahlaka Bai and Kushal Khan Anu in Naizame, Hyderabad. So in case that's not enough to whet your appetite, uh, let me tell you a little bit about our most distinguished speaker. Catherine Butler Schofield is a historian of music and listening in early modern North Indian, excuse me, early modern North Indian, North India and the Deccan based at King's College London. In telling stories about lives in music, she writes on sovereignty and selfhood, affection and desire, sympathy and loss and power worldly and strange. Her latest book, Music and Musicians in Late Mughal India, Histories of the Ephemeral, 1748 to 1858, will be out with Cambridge University Press in 2022. Her previous edited volumes are Tellings and Texts with Francesca Orsini, Open Book 2015, and Monsoon Feelings with Margaret Perno and M.K. Rajamani, Niyogi, 2018. Catherine, the floor is yours, and we are looking forward to a wonderful uh, retelling of history, music, and listening, as you say. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a lovely introduction. Uh, namaste, adab, and hello to all of you. Okay. In October 1799, an ambitious Shia nobleman at the court of the Nizam of Hyderabad put on a nudge. This wasn't just any old evening's entertainment. Mir Alam's assembly was a massive song, dance, and fireworks extravaganza to celebrate the recent victory of the combined British and Hyderabad forces over the powerful ruler of Mysore, Tipu Sultan. Into the midst of this party stepped a woman, elegant, beautiful, dark hair plaited to beneath her waist, dressed in the airiest of coloured muslins, weighted down with exquisite jewels. She was the fabled Chanda Bibi Malakabai Chanda, who died in 1824, the moon of Hyderabad, and her presence was as political and ritually auspicious as her role was to give all eyes and ears their pleasure. Intimate companion in her lifetime to three prime ministers and two Nizams, never married and independently wealthy, a patron of the arts in her own right, the best known female Urdu poet of the age and a famously talented performer. She danced and sang her way into British history that night by pirouetting up to the deputy British resident, Captain John Malcolm, and presenting him with a sought after copy of her Diwan, the Diwan of Chanda, the moon, her Tachalus or nom de plume. It eventually made its way out of Malcolm's breast pocket and lies where he left it in the India office collections now at the British Library in London, where this breathtaking moment in which two competing cultures brushed hands is pinned down ever so tentatively in this little note on the flyleaf. Obscured by Malaka's luminescence today is a man who was equally central to the musical life of the Hyderabad court, if not quite so exposed to the limelight. More importantly, he was crucial to Malaka. He was her ustad, the master musician who trained her from youth and taught her everything she knew about singing and composing songs in Hindustani rugs, but also seems to have been the closest thing she had to a father figure. He was the, he was the Delhi lineage Kalawant Khushal Khan Anup, whose takhalos meant beyond compare or the incomparable. He may have slipped quietly into the edge of the picture here of Malaka singing to the earliest great patron, 
Raja Rarampa, you can see him there at the bottom, the calmly seated man in white and green. But he wrote the book in which this illustration is housed, his Prajpasha Ragdarshan of 1800, thus immortalizing both their lives and their connection with each other. Anup belonged to one of the most prestigious lineages of hereditary musicians attached to the imperial court in Delhi. His father, Karim Khan, had been the special disciple of Firoz Khan Adarang during the reign of Emperor Muhammad Shah. But sometime in the middle decades of the 18th century, Karim moved his family southwards, ending up in the independent state of Hyderabad. His son, Anup, was prominent in the court circles of successive Nizams, especially Nizam Ali Khan and Sikandar Jah, as a vocalist, teacher, song composer, and a treatise writer in Persian and Prajpasha from before 1791 until his death around 1836. Anup was clearly a brilliant figure, revered in his time as a singer of Mughal court music in the most exclusive private salons, whose patrons included many of the major notables of the city. And if his endowments at the hilltop shrine of Mullah Ali are anything to go by, he departed this earth a wealthy man. But he's largely remembered today, when he's remembered at all, only as the man behind the illustrious moon of Hyderabad. We've become used to thinking of celebrated Indian courtesans like Malaka as powerful, refined, and highly literate, thanks in large part to Hindi cinema, the Mughal era image of what a courtesan was and meant to wider society has never quite faded away. But musicians like Anup explode enduring preconceptions of the hereditary male masters of Hindustani music, the Muslim Ustads. Today's music histories still tell us that the Ustads of North India were illiterate, or more generously, did not use writing in teaching and performance, thus rendering their historical performances and lives unrecoverable, and their music passed down to the present only by oral transmission. A major aim this evening is to demonstrate that this wasn't true. Anup was one of at least three members of the Delhi Kalawant lineages that just in his own lifetime, who left behind erudite, innovative, sometimes even moving and witty writings on music theory and history. These prove beyond doubt such musicians command of Persian, Hindavi, and even Sanskrit, and their extraordinary personal knowledge of Hindustani music. So today I'm going to retell the lives of Anup, Malaka, Hindustani music, and their main patrons in Nizami Hyderabad through the collective writings of Anup, a single literate musician. In doing so, I will also show how we can use what might appear to be unpromising source material to shed unexpected light on the wider life of this important successor state. I'm coaxing my stories almost entirely from Anup's two major works of musical writing, his music treatise, the Rag Darshan, which went through at least three versions in Prajpasha and Persian between 1815, and his song collection, nearly 2,000 strong, the Ragragni Rosa Shab, completed 1833 to 36. Although we know a great deal more about her than him, thanks especially to Scott Kugel's landmark biography of Malaka, their life stories were utterly entangled with each other's. They worked for the same series of patrons at the same times, Later in life, they lived in the same house. They both seem to have been Shia Muslims and both are buried at the foot of the holy mountain of Mullah Ali in Hyderabad, to whose shrine they were devoted. While Malaka did not write on music to our knowledge, she did write extremely accomplished song lyrics. And some of the occasion pieces she wrote in Hindavi under Anup's musical instruction are included in his Rag Ragni. And it was for Malaka's use that Anup wrote his last bilingual version of the Rag Darshan in 1815. The question I particularly want to explore then is this, what did a late Mughal master of the quintessentially ephemeral and unwritable act of performing and passing on music write when he wrote about music and why? I'm going to begin with a brief examination of the two works I'll draw on. On the left is a folio from Anup's song collection, the Rag Ragni Rosa Shab, now in the Salarjang Museum, showing a page of compositions set in Ragni Kamaj. The main collection was completed on the 3rd of March, 1833, and is an exhaustive set of the elite courtly songs in the repertoire of Anup's Galawant lineage stemming from the Mughal court in Delhi. It's a cornucopia of compositions by 
great names of the Mughal past like Surdas, Tansen, Baz Bahadur, Jagannath, Kabirai, Sararang and Adarang especially and many more besides. This collection represents a much earlier stage of the transmission of elite Hindustani songs than the earliest sound recordings and the Rag Ragni is thus one of the most valuable remaining documents of its kind and I really would urge anybody who works in Pratipasha in Nastanik script uh, to look at this manuscript and do a study of it. It also includes several songs written in the style and genres of the Mughal tradition that Anup himself and occasionally Malaka wrote in Hyderabad to honor a number of different patrons there. The songs are in many languages. Alongside Praj Pasha, they're in Rehta, Persian and Punjabi, and they serve to demonstrate the enormous range of Anup's literacy, linguistic ability and astonishing powers of recall. In terms of genre, they're representative of the discrete set of pan-regional genres that at this time marked out the elite repertoire of Hindustani music from other rural, devotional or local repertoires, while making room for new compositions designed specifically for local events. In addition to the main collection, a substantial number of devotional or praise songs were added to the margins that are frequently dated, the latest of them to October 1836. These nearly all have Shia themes and were written and performed by Anup and or Malaka to mark the various festivals on the hill of Mola Ali. The Rag Ragni was patently designed for the practical use of singers who needed to find and recall an appropriate song quickly. The book's very easy to navigate with its paginated table of contents, which you see here, and is set out according to a wholly musical logic. It's organized at the top level by rags appropriate to daytime versus those appropriate to night. Within that, all the songs in a particular rag are grouped together. The order is interesting in that all those sung in particular seasons of the year, the springtime rags Hindol, Basant and Baha, or the monsoon rags Meg, Gond, Malha and Suramalha are clustered together, as are rags with multiple famous varieties, such as the Sarang family. Not only are the rags not ordered according to the aesthetic ragamala or garland of ragas system of six male rags, each with five wives that Anup used in his rag darshans, but several of the raganis he described in his music treatises don't appear at all in his song collection. The rag ragni was clearly representative of the rags in current practice. Finally, Anup divided the songs in each rag ragni into genre sections, drupids, tamars, etc., historically the birthright of the Kalawans of Delhi, Hori's, which are specific to the Holy Festival, and Khayal's, Papa's, etc., which traditionally belonged to the Sufi Qawal lineages, but which were now also established repertoire within Anup's own Kandari lineage of Kalawans. We can use the songs in the Rag Ragni to tell us various stories, but here I'll mainly use Anup's collection as a trove of information about the history of his lineage the state of Hindustani music at this point in time, the courtly musical life of Hyderabad, and especially the annual cycle of ritual events there, principally at Mullah Ali, but also the spring festivals of Basant, Holi, and Noruz, which feature heavily. Most of tonight's paintings are illustrated folios from Anup's earliest version of the Rag Darshan, held in the University of Pennsylvania. This version of his music treatise was dedicated to Anup's and Malaka's early patron, the Maratha general Raja Rao Rambha Nimbalkar Jayawant Bahadur, and written in Prajpasha, in verse, widely used throughout India at this time as a pan-regional language of courtly poetry and song. This is the illustration. Whoops. I've got these out of order again. This is the, <laughs> this is the illustration for the Ragini Kambavati that accompanies Anup's compact verse description or doha of her iconic form. Anup's first rag darshan is a fascinating landmark, not because of its very canonical contents, but because of what it is and what Anup did with it subsequently. It's a translation into Braj Pasha of the key Mughal Persian treatise on music, chapter five of Mirza Khan's Tofad al Hind, which is circa 1675 and got an example on the right. The Tofat was a comprehensive manual of Indian aesthetic sciences, everything a Persian reading aspiring aficionado would need to know in order to appreciate and perhaps to compose and perform poetry and song in Braj Pasha, the language of Braj, but also the Mughal courtly register of Hindavi. 
The Tophet was a masterpiece of erudite scholarship with a royal provenance dating from the reign of the last powerful Mughal emperor, Aurangzeb. It was inevitable that it would rapidly become a major canonical reference work for later writers. There are at least eight copies in the British Library alone. This included Europeans such as Sir William Jones, whose heavily annotated copy of the whole Tophet is in the British Library and is a major primary source for understanding his own groundbreaking 1784 English treatise on the musical modes of the Hindus. Consciously conservative, even in its own time, chapter five of the Tophet is almost entirely a digest of earlier 17th century writings on music in Sanskrit, Persian, and Prajpasha frequently verbatim. The Tophet's appeal to elite lovers of Hindustani music lay in its comprehensive coverage and systematic reconciliation of all the information fit to know at the Mughal court at its peak, drawn from the most authoritative works of the age. In other words, it's ecumenical synthesis of Indic and Persianate streams of Hindustani musical knowledge. Its appeal also lay in its royal pedigree. It was written for Mughal Prince Muhammad Azam Shah, who died in 1707, which led to its early acceptance as a work of unimpeachable authority. But it also lay in its inclusion of a Persian prose translation of the Sangeeta Dharapana's popular set of verse descriptions, dhyanas, of the six male rags and 30 female raganis as heroes, heroines, yoginis, and deities in the Hanuman Mutt scheme. Namodaras translated dhyanas in both Persian and Prajpasha versions were quickly dislodged from their surrounding treatises and used to caption new sets of Ragamala paintings, which then proliferated wildly in the 18th century. Richard Johnson, for instance, commissioned an entire set of new Ragamala paintings in Lucknow inscribed with the Tophat's descriptions. Finally, the Tophat is written in a straightforward and accessible style, making it an easy manual to use. Very early on, Music Lovers detached chapter five from its parent volume, and it began circulating as a standalone music treatise to be studied, copied, and built upon. From the 18th century, chapter five began to be reused widely in the writing of new music treatises as both a structural model and an authoritative source of canonical knowledge, not just in Persian, but in Hindavi and later Bengali, Urdu, and even English. What Anup did with the Tufat was unique. He clearly owned a copy, and in his successive Rag Darshans, he reworked chapter five of the Tufat at least three times to suit the abilities, needs, and agendas of different patrons. Firstly, he translated it into Prajpasha verse and had it copiously illustrated with paintings for Raja Rao Rampa in 1800. Then in 1808, Anup reworked his Prajpasha version into simplified Persian prose for Nizam Sikandar Jah at the request of Nawab Mir Alam, the Nizam's prime minister. Finally, in 1815, he produced a bilingual version for Malaka that interweaved his Prajpasha verse translation with yet another slightly different rewriting in Persian. I'm going to concentrate largely on the first and most remarkable Rag Darshan in Braj, though I will refer to the other versions. I have worked primarily with the intact copy of Anup's Braj Pasha Rag Darshan at the University of Pennsylvania, produced for Rao Rampa in April 1800, with charming but slightly uh, inexpert illustrations made in 1804 by a forgotten minor painter, Hajimir Ghulam Hassan. It's long been apparent that many of his illustrations were copies of paintings by major Hyderabad artists such as Rai Venkat Chalam and Tajali Ali Shah, but it's recently become clear that Anu prepared an earlier copy of the entire treatise, written in a very similar hand but with much more beautiful illustrations. Several detached folios depicting rags and raganis, complete with the correct dohas, came up for sale at Sotheby's in 2013. It's likely to be the original. On the left is the Knight Ragni Kampavati in the University of Pennsylvania copy. In the classic Ragmala iconography on the right, Kampavati is usually shown as the god Brahma being worshipped by a female attendant. But Ghulam Hassan's image was instead created to match the more courtly scenario presented in the Tofat al-Hind. Here, Brahma is replaced by a beautiful lady enjoying the company of her friends who sing beautifully. Night and day, she is joyful and busy experiencing the full richness of the sights and sounds of music and dance. 
This is simplified in Anoop's 1808 Persian translation as a very beautiful lady in a red sari and green angia sitting in the seat of honor face to face with her dancing tawaifs. This is an icon of Kambavati from what is patently the earlier copy of Anoop's Rav Darshan for Rao Ramba. Not only are the visual similarities with the previous obvious, it's captioned with Anoop's Dohas describing Kambavati exactly as in the University of Pennsylvania copy. There's no section for Ragni Kambavati in Anoop's song collection, but there is for Kambavati's close relative, Kamaj, in which Anoop wrote the following khayal. Today's bliss spreads through the abstinent heart, meeting the one whose love for Ali is beyond compare, i.e. Anoop. By the full moon, i.e. Chanda, all hearts pause before beautiful Rao Rampa. If we combine the iconic with the sonic, as is the whole point of the rag, this painting takes on a whole new resonance. Look at the moon. Rao Rampa was one of Malakabai's earliest patrons, He's remembered today for his devoted love for her, and named pictures of Malaka are everywhere in Anoop's treatise for Rao Rampa. This strongly suggests that Kambavati is, in fact, a painting of Malaka, perhaps seated in the garden of her house, with her atelier of trainee courtesans before her. But this rendition is much more than mere narrative record. A world meets in Kambavati Kamaj the saintly presence of Ali, to whom Malaka and Anoop were devoted, the worldly blessing of Rao Rampa, Malaka's luminescence and Anoop's knowledge as the man behind the moon, the Mughal heritage of the author and the canonical treatise he was translating, the Maratha heritage of its new patron, the Nizami heritage of the painters, the long journeys they'd all taken to end up in this single space of Hyderabad, all wrapped up in a musical mode, a page in a music treatise, watched over by Hazrat Ali and the auspicious light of the illustrious moon. The whole world of Nizami Hyderabad and the tiny world of Anup Malaka and Rao Rampa within it is here in the treatise Anup first composed for Rao Rampa. I'll now turn to their lives as they unfold within his various acts of writing, beginning with what we can piece together of Anup's life before sketching Malaka's rather better known story. And then I'll turn again to Anup's work to collect, consider what they tell us about the life of music amongst Hyderabad's most prominent players at the turn of the 19th century. While their names are now inseparable from our image of Hyderabad, both Hushal Khan Anoop and Malaka Bhai Chanda were second generation migrants to the Deccan from North India. Their presence at the court of Hyderabad in the late 18th century was due to what Anoop referred to broadly as the changing fortunes of the time in Kalab and the collapse of the Sultanate. The demographic upheaval in the Mughal heartlands caused by the series of invasions and pitched battles between the Mughals, Marathas, Afghans, Rohilas, British and others that marred the middle decades of the 18th century. This led to a major shift of talented and able people out of their original homelands in the north in search of more settled and prosperous places to live and work. Among migrants who came south to Hyderabad were a privileged and well-connected Delhi hereditary musician from the central imperial lineage named Karim Khan, Anoop's father, and an abandoned daughter turned courtesan from Ahmedabad in Gujarat, whose name was Raj Kunwar Bai, Malaka's mother. Anoop was born in Delhi, probably sometime in the early 1750s, and died in Hyderabad, where he was apparently still composing songs as late as 1836. The carefully curated snippets of autobiography Anoop presented in his Rag Darshans root the court music of Nizami Hyderabad circa 1800 firmly back in the soil of Mughal Delhi at its peak. His genealogical imagination was firmly Delhi-centric, even while overtly honouring his later Hyderabad location as if he saw his life's work to be recreating through music, imperial court culture at the breakaway court of Hyderabad. Anoop traced his blood and musical descent from the two most important intermarried lineages of Mughal imperial galawants, those of the greatest Hindustani musicians of all time, Tansen of Akbar's court in the 16th century and Niamat Khan Sadarang of Muhammad Shah's. Alongside Ziauddin and the author of Edinburgh um, Manuscript number 500, 585 number four. Anoop was among the early, earliest theorists to draw attention 
to the fact that the four main branches of the Delhi Galawant Brotherhood that had emerged by the end of the 18th century practiced different stylistic schools that we now call Barneys and which they then called Barneys. He wrote, the term for each of these is Gut, class, family, lineage, which means a qualm. That is to say, there are numerous branches and sub-branches of Galawans. Each of these has an originator who had a fresh style and who was the progenitor, progenitor of a large stylistic school. Premier among them is the line of Mian Tansen. Anup's treatises leave precisely how he was descended from Tansen ambiguous. What is clearer is that properly he belonged to the Kandari Bani, whose central 18th century representative was Sadarang. According to Anup, the founder of his own family line, his great-great-grandfather Mian Kunhi Khan, belonged to the Kandari branch. Sadarang was still alive when Anup's father, Karim Khan, started learning the family trade in Delhi, but it was Sadarang's nephew, Adarang, who trained Karim up as his special shagird. Of the three Galawant specialisms, Karim became a singer, and in his prime he was known by the epithet Roga Awaz, the full-bloomed voice. Two key distinctives of the 18th century Kandari school were that, after Sadarang, its masters composed as many khayals and related forms as they did drippids, and they were devoted Sufi adepts with strong discipular connections to the Sufi order of Khajamir Dard. Both of these characteristics are amply demonstrated in Anup's collection of song repertoire. It's not clear when Karim left Delhi for good, taking his children with him. Anup's 1808 autobiographical note leaps over several decades from Karim's service under Muhammad Shah directly to them coming to Hyderabad, finding there a patron in Raja Rao. Elite musicians and courtesans were almost certainly among the first large scale group of Mughal court musicians, migrants, sorry, who returned south with the first Asaf Jahi Nizam, Nizam al Mulk, who died in. 48, 1748, after Nadir Shah humiliated the Mughal armies defending Delhi in 1739. The Nizam held a particular allure for servants of the Mughal Empire who wanted to maintain their loyalties, culture, and way of life. Although Nizam al Mulk essentially held power in the Deccan outright from the 1720s, he and his successors continued to consider and even call themselves Mughals well into the 19th century. Munas Farooqi notes that Hyderabad was especially attractive to northern migrants. Quote, Hyderabad's success in attracting the talented and the adventurous can be seen in the arrival of large numbers of often highly skilled and educated Punjabi countries, North Indian Kayasts, Sheikh Sadas and Awadis, and ethnic Iranians and Central Asians. Others who joined this influx included trading, cultivating, and warrior groups. When Nizam al Mulk marched back to the Deccan after a two year stint in Delhi between 1738 and 1740, he returned with thousands of administrators, religious scholars, intellectuals, military men, and master craftsmen in tow. Unquote. It seems unlikely that Karim and Anup were among this early group of Mughal migrants, not least because it's improbable that Anup was born as early as 1740. More to the point, the latest of Adarang's songs in Anup's Rag Ragni were composed for Mughal Emperor Alamgir II between 1754 and 1759, and Sadullah Khan Rohila, who died in 1761. These are occasion pieces of limited mobility that would have been transmitted to Karim orally, indicating he was still resident in the Delhi region until at least 1761. As Malakabai's Ustad, Anup must have been at least 10 to 15 years older than her. She was born in 1768. I'm going to suggest, in the absence of firmer evidence, then, that Anup was probably born in the mid 1750s and that his family left Delhi for the south around 1760 during the time of greatest chaos and threat to life in the Mughal capital. Anup's 1815 account suggests that Karim and his family, including his brothers and his sons, Anup and Raza Khan, left Delhi for the Deccan and eventually found their way to Hyderabad sometime before 1791 when Karim died. They found Hyderabad particularly hospitable, full of appreciative, well-educated -edu and financially generous patrons of all backgrounds. The first to take Karim and Anup under his wing was Rao Rampa, 
the man who was also probably Malaka's first patron. Karim's and Anoop's passport into elite Hyderabadi circles, the authoritative proof that they were who they said they were, was the exclusive musical property they carried with them in their bodies from Delhi. Their ability to remember and reproduce multiple rags and thousands of songs composed by their ancestors at the Mughal court. Precisely because it was proof of status, family song repertoire was and still is fiercely guarded intellectual property within musical lineages. Anoop's enormous song collection thus adds significant empirical weight to his claims that he and his father were indeed members of the prestigious Kandari lineage come down from Mughal, Delhi. In contrast, the details of Ma Lakabai's family heritage are rather less verifiable, even though she dictated them herself to her biographer, Ghulam Hussein Johar, in 1814. Unlike Anoop, Malaka was born in Hyderabad in 1768 as Chanda Bibi, to a Saida turned courtesan married late in life to a Hyderabadi nobleman. Malaka claimed her maternal grandparents were Sayyids and therefore of high social status. According to Ghulam Hussein, her grandfather was a Mughal administrator in Ahmedabad in Gujarat during the reign of Muhammad Shah. Having fallen on hard times, he abandoned his family, leaving his wife and three daughters in poverty to fend for themselves. Resourcefully and somewhat unusually, Malaka's chaste grandmother and her daughters joined a troupe of Bhagats, performing artists who served the minor Rajput court of Diolia near Ajmer. Kugel suggests this was the community of traveling male performers, otherwise called bhans or nakals, notorious for mimicry and satire, as well as the attractive singing, dancing and seductive wiles of their cross-dressing dancing boys, who were often taken as lovers by elite men. However, the description he translates from Hulam Hussein suggests to me these bhagats were instead bhagtans the type of much higher status and ritually auspicious female courtesans, often Muslim, employed at Rajput courts to perform for religious and state ceremonies and to train women of the Zanana in music and dance. This seems considerably more likely. Either way, this particular troupe undertook to train Malaka's mother, Nidabai, and aunts in singing and dancing and took them with them from Rajasthan to the Deccan. Eventually, at Burhanpur, the three sisters met up with the army of Nizam al Mulk and became camp followers. Midabai especially became famous amongst the Nizam's courtiers, and by the time they reached Aurangabad, according to Kugel, the whole family changed their names, adopting stage names befitting royal courtesans. Late in life, having settled in Hyderabad, Midabai, now entitled Raj Kunwarbai, married a nobleman and gave birth to the girl who became Malaka by Chanda. Malaka was raised and trained in the household of her eldest half-sister, Mahtab, also a courtesan who had become the second wife of Nizam Ali Khan's prime minister of the day, Rukun Dola. Although traditionally elite courtesans did not marry and Malaka did not, being a successful courtesan in Hyderabad clearly was not a barrier to marriage into the nobility and perhaps even acted as a passport into it. After marriage, Malaka's mother continued close ties with several of Hyderabad's most powerful and notable people. These men, some of whose portraits also appear in Anoop's Ragdarshan, seem to have taken a close interest in Malaka's upbringing. The poet and painter Tajali Ali Shah, the next prime minister and Hyderabad's most powerful man, Aristajar, and his protege and rival, Nawab Mir Alam, the prime minister after Aristajar. Mir Alam claimed he first fell in love with Malaka as a young man when he was her Persian teacher. She learned Urdu poetry with Tajali Ali and his senior disciple, Muhammad Sher Khan Iman. Given the matrilineal nature of courtesan training, she almost certainly learned to dance from her sister or possibly her mother, but she also had some training with a Nakal known as Panna. Crucially for our story, it was also in this setting that Malaka first entered the life into her lifelong connection with Anoop. He trained her in the Kandari lineage of Mughal court music, including the arts of singing and composing songs in North Indian rags. It was from Anoop that Malaka learned to set her famous ghazals to the most suitable rags and tals, how to compose khayals, papas, horis, and occasion pieces, jashans, in drippered form, and how to sing all of them tastefully and well with her accompanying musicians. I'm going to suggest that it was in fact with Anoop that Malaka enjoyed her most enduring and significant relationship.
We can't know its exact nature because we don't have enough information. But right from this early formative moment until her death in 1824-5, Anoop and Malaka worked for the same patrons at the same points in time and lived together in her mansion at Nampali, where he continued to advise her and to train her many female protégés. Perhaps, as an Ustad should be, he was a trusted and beloved father figure to a woman for whom all other men were ultimately only available to be manipulated for wealth and preferment. Between the 1780s and 1820s, Malaka and Anoop worked within the rarefied circles of Hyderabad's top nobility for several overlapping patrons. Two Sunni Nizams, two Shia prime ministers of Iranian extraction, a Maratha Hindu general and a North Indian Hindu finance minister. Neither musician appears to have been on an exclusive retainer with a single patron at any point. The list of their principal shared patrons indicates the extent to which elite members of the main competing factions in southern India at this time, the Marathas, the Mughal successor states and the British, had come to a level of cultural and political accommodation at the Nizam's court. Present day identity poli politics do not map well onto this historical situation. While a Hindu Maratha like Rao Rampar could serve the Nizam with loyalty and love to the extent of celebrating Muslim festivals with personal fervor, the two patrons who hated each other the most, Aristujar and Mir Alam, were both aristocratic Iranians by heritage and Shia by religion. Nor did friendships or tensions between patrons appear to dictate whom Malaka and Anup were able to work for. This suggests that their esteem was so high that patrons were forced to compete for their attentions and not the other way around. Kugel has suggested that Aristujar groomed Malaka from childhood to get her into Nizam Ali Khan's permanent household as part of a political strategy to influence him through female companions. We know Aristujar deployed related tactics to devastating effect in the tragic saga narrated by William Dalrymple of noblewoman Chironis' romantic relationship with the British resident James Kirkpatrick between 1799 and 1805. Aristujar was probably a pivotal patron for Malaka in that, as Prime Minister from the time she was seven years old, he was a powerful advocate for her at the Nizam's court. Nizam Ali Khan did indeed take her up as a companion in the mid-1780s when she was about 15 and she remained a favourite until he died in 1803. Malaka accompanied the Nizam hunting and on military campaigns and sang and danced as a star performer in his private parties and on public occasions, which were as much political as they were entertainment. After her particularly stunning performance at Noruz in 1802, aged 34 and in her prime, she was given the formal court title Malakabai, Lady Moonchik. The Nizam ennobled her and endowed her with sufficient lands to make her wealthy for life. But the entire time she was working for Nizam Ali Khan and Aris Tujar, she and her beloved music teacher were also being patronized by the Maratha general Raja Rao Rampa. Indeed, Malaka's biography and Anup's first two Ragdarshans indicate that Rao Rampa was for both of them their first highly ranked patron. Rao Rampa belonged to the Maratha Nimbalkar dynasty, who were relatives of the ruling Porsle family in Pune. Rao Rampa's grandfather had a history of distinguished service to the Mughals, and Rao Rampa himself was widely admired, even by the British, for his military skills, astonishing bravery and loyalty to the Nizams and the company's interests, and especially for his conspicuous valour fighting against Tipu Sultan. Rao Rampa was famously in love with Malaka. Taken as a whole, I would argue Anup's production of his first Ragdarshan is designed to celebrate the union of patron and musician in a very specific historical context, mm -hmm. down to the unusual choice to compose it in Brajpasha, the high vernacular of the Mughal court, but also of the Hindu god Krishna. Many of the paintings celebrate Malaka's intimacy with Rao Rampa, but also her prowess in the context of Rao Rampa's mastery of the Mughal courtly arts of pen and sword. In a sequence of paintings, Rao Rampa studies poetry with Iman, who was also Malaka's teacher, at the same time as his animal keeper feeds his pet tigers. He selects a choice pair of captive birds, he flies pigeons with his bird keeper, he examines a beautiful new stallion, and he goes hawking on horseback. This last painting is, I think, particularly important. Firstly, Rao Rampa was famous for his love of horses, 
and Malaka is known to have brought horses back from her expeditions with the Nizam as a present especially for him, including one instance around this very time. It's also quite obviously an homage to the iconic paintings of Malaka Bai Chanda Bibi's illustrious historical namesake, Chand Bibi, the famous warrior queen of the 16th century Deccan hunting with hawks. And it incorporates a subtle element taken from Venkat Chalam's paintings of Malaka going hunting with the Nizam, the bullock cart carrying cheetahs. Through this rich intermediality, the two of them, patron and courtesan, are joined together here in a heavily symbol-laden image. But all three of them, Anup, Malaka and Rao Rampa, are also made intimate through the gentler courtly arts as well. In the opening of the Rag Darshan, we see Malaka singing to Rao Rampa and Anup presenting his book to his patron. The paintings towards the end show Rao Rampa in private audience with Anup singing to the tambura accompaniment of his disciple Ghazi Khan, playing holy in a riot of pink and orange colours with Malaka and Anup at the bottom there, and finally, just before the colophon that concludes the book, watching Malaka dance for him by candlelight. Both Malaka and Anup long outlived these early patrons. Nizam Ali Khan died in 1803, Aristoja shortly afterwards in 1804, and Ra Rampa likewise. The deaths of these powerful old men mark the definitive end of an era and the beginning of a more British-leaning dispensation in Hyderabad. The Nizam had already signed a permanent treaty of alliance with the East India Company in 1798 that placed Hyderabad under British protection. And the new prime minister in 1804, Aristoja's old enemy, Mir Alam, was an Anglophile who'd risen to power as an agent of the company. Nonetheless, Malaka and Anup segued seamlessly over to the patronage of the new Nizam, Sikandar Jah, and especially to Mir Alam, with whom Malaka almost certainly had a sexual relationship. In fact, we know Mir Alam was already commissioning her to perform several years before Aristuja died because it was at Mir Alam's party in 1799 that she danced for John Malcolm. In 1808, at the request of Mir Alam, acting on a suggestion by Malaka, Anup retranslated his Braj Pasha verse Rag Darshan back into Persian prose for Nizam Sikandarjah. As he wrote, I put it back into Persian again, dressing the newly wedded bride of the Hindi language in Persian clothing. Anup neatly rounded off this statement with a Persian couplet whose end rhyme, Tufat, paid subtle homage to the original Mughal prose masterpiece, the Tufat al-Hind, that inspired this whole chain of clever translations. Apart from the introduction, which is written in the highly rhetorical style of literary Persian, like Anup's compact Brajpasha verses, the remainder of this rendering is quite simple and curtailed in comparison with the Tufat. It really does seem to be a retranslation directly from the Brajpasha. That same year, though, Mir Alam died suddenly. And power in Hyderabad and our two protagonists with it shifted decisively to Sikandar Jha's brilliant Diwan or finance minister, Maharaja Chandula. The high placed and even more pro British North Indian Khatri, who was the most powerful nobleman in Hyderabad until his death in 1845. Chandulal, who became Prime Minister de Jure in 1833, was well known for his cultural pursuits. As a talented Persian and Urdu poet himself, Chandulal would have found Malaka particularly compelling. But from a more political point of view, in this new era, she was also a prize asset because she had a history of sharing her manifest talents and those of the girls she was training with British lovers of courtesans. Chandulal thus became famed for putting on lavish assemblies featuring Malaka as star performer in a special pavilion he had built specifically to impress political and especially British guests. The final copy of the Rag Darshan Anup wrote for Malaka in 1815 was written in Chandulal's orbit, and it was bilingual. Anup quoted his original Brajbash of verses line by line against a new and improved version of his Persian translation, as if he were creating a study manual for Malaka. And in this version, out of subservience to Chandulal, Maharaja Ocean of Gifts and Maharaja Pearl of Good Manners, Anup erased the memory of all of his and Malaka's previous patrons, including Mir Alam and Rao Rampa, replacing references to them with encomiums to Chandulal. 
The Rag Rag Ni Rosa Shab was also completed during the period of Maharaja Chandulal's political supremacy and reveals him to have been Anup's and Malaka's principal 19th century patron. Anup's song collection in turn also helps us identify key moments in the ritual year of Hyderabad for all for members of all communities. In particular, it reveals that spring festivals in the Persian and Indian solar calendars, Basant, Holi and Noruz, were key ecumenical occasions for the court. Interestingly, a large proportion of the songs written specifically for Chandulal were set in spring rags, Drupads in Hindal and Khayals and Khapas in Bihar, with lyrics celebrating the spring festival Basant, clearly important to Hindus in Hyderabad. One of the last songs composed by Anup was a covet for the spring wedding in 1834 of Chandulal's grandson, the son of Raja Bala Pershad. There are also, of course, a large number of Hori's in numerous rags scattered throughout the collection to be sung during the Holy Spring Festival. Anup's and Malaka's songs show us a yearly cycle punctuated by ritual events and public affairs like weddings, all celebrated with music and dance. The main insight their lyrics give us into the annual life of Hyderabad in the early 19th century, though, concerns the Shia ritual year. As Scott Kugel has demonstrated, Malaka's Urdu ghazals show her to have been a committed Shia Muslim, although the Nizams themselves were Sunni Muslims. Since the time of the Qutb Shahi rulers of Golconda, Hyderabad had been an important Shia centre. Hazrat Ali is also venerated in Sufi traditions. Ali devotion substantially crosses sectarian lines. Nizam Ali Khan revived state patronage of Hyderabad's important Shia shrine, enclosing the relic of Hazrat Ali's handprint, located on top of the mountain of Mullah Ali, an important site of Shia, Sufi and Hindu pilgrimage. And Malaka and Anup were both major donors to the Dargah, patronizing and performing at the many annual Shia and shrine specific festivals there. A few of the songs Malaka composed for these occasions are preserved in Anup's Rag Ragni, as well as many more composed by him that she would very likely have performed. The mostly Shia songs in the margins, many of them dated, and also in the occasion piece sections of Anup's song collection, help us to reconstruct the rhythms of the Islamic ritual year for which musicians like Anup and Malaka wrote new songs annually, except for the all important 10 days of Maharam for which no songs were ever composed. These were in chronological order, the birth of the prophet of Islam, the Urs or death anniversary of the Sufi master Abdul Qadir Jalani, the birth of Hazrat Ali, the Urs of the Mullah Ali Dargah itself, and Eid Khadir, the day when the prophet declared that whoever calls me master, Ali is also their master. Mullah Ali. For example, Malaka and or Anup wrote this Munajat in Drupad style and set it in the versatile Rag Bhairavi. Thus give me aid from the unseen, for I am weak and in need of your generosity, O King of Men Ali, the ruler of all land and sea. I may be just a dancing girl, but let me remain joyful, Khushal, in this Anup's garden. This much please give me for the sake of Hassan and Hussein. That's Kugel's translation. It's not clear whether or not Anup also became a Shia. Other contemporary members of Sadarang's lineage remained devoted to the Sufi order of Khaja Mirdard. Anup did compose a number of songs on Shia themes, mostly for festivals, but also in generic courtly styles. But we need to remember that composing pieces for special occasions was his job. In this period in India, the personal beliefs of the composer and performer of songs were completely irrelevant. Professional musicians like Anup were commissioned to compose and sing songs to their patrons and their patrons deities and saints as a matter of course, regardless of whether or not they shared their beliefs. Even if some of Anup's Shia themed songs do appear to reflect his personal inclinations, devotion to Hazrat Ali was embraced by Sufis as well. This courtly Khayal song, for instance, was composed by Sadarang and venerates both Hazrat Ali and the Sunni founder of the Chishti Sufi order, Khaja Moinuddin. And this is again in Kugel's translation. Preserve the life honorable Mullah Ali of those who call out for safety and security, make all their troubles easy. 
I find that by your grace, Hassan and Hussein rule over more than both worlds. Let me be sacrificed, 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 sacrificed for the sake of Mola Ali, Mola Ali. Give me faith and righteousness. Let me achieve this goal. Look upon me with kindness, Khaja Moin, and aid this humblest follower of faith. Please accept this small request of Sararang and protect us poor beggars. It wouldn't have been necessary for Anoop to convert in order to express his devotion to Hazrat Ali to the extraordinary extent that he did. Without Malakas and Anoop's personal patronage and that of several of their patrons, the hill of Mola Ali would look very different today. The Darga itself was much older, but according to epigraphs on other monuments on the hill, most of the important buildings were endowed by members of Malakas and Anoop's circle. Raja Rao Rampa built a summer pavilion uh, there and Maharaja Chandula, the great entrance gate housing the drum house, the Nakara Khana. On her mother's death in 1792, Malaka built a magnificent tomb complex at the base of the hill, complete with an Ashur Khana set in a beautiful formal garden. Malaka was herself laid to rest there in 1824-5. But it was Anoop who expended his considerable wealth to build many of the principal buildings on the hill. The inscription on the great Ashur Khan he erected reads, By good fortune, Khushal Khan, with true and sincere intention to seek the pleasure of God, erected the arch, the mosque, and the grand Ashur Khana, the inn, Sarai, and the Fakir stand, Takia, on the ven venerable hill. Inscriptions elsewhere tell us that he also built a drinking water basin on the route via which the sandal is carried, as well as a small garden just beneath the skirts of the hill. And like his illustrious disciple, Anup too is buried in the garden that he planted at Mola Ali. Of the Braj Pasha lyrics Anup included in his song collection, there is no literal overlap that I've yet found with the Braj Pasha verses that constitute his first Rag Darshan. Instead, his two major works, his song collection and his music treatise in its various versions complement, amplify and enrich each other, just as Mala Kabai, Chanda and Khushal Khan Anup complemented and completed each other in their life's work together. Anup's two written works clearly embody different facets of the complex and comprehensive vision of a single master musician scholar that saw no conflict, but a seamless continuity between theoretical and practical written and oral knowledge. In one crucial self-referential image in his Braj, Braj Pasha Rag Darshan, Anup sits opposite his patron, Rao Rampa, and presents his written music treatise to him. Here, Anup is not merely a master of the practical arts of music making, but of its literature and theory as well making him fit to sit face to face with the Nizami nobility. Anup's choices to write songs and a treatise in Prajpasha verse, and to write in both rhetorical and practical registers of Persian prose, show off his mastery, despite his location in far off Hyderabad, of the Mughal official language and of the classical register of Hindavi local to the Delhi Agra region. Anup's 1800 Rag Darshan turns out to be many things. It is a celebration of the rich and fluid court culture of Nizam Ali Khan's Hyderabad, as easily embraced by a Maratha Hindu warrior as a Shia courtesan. It's also a monument to the ultimately transient but consuming love between Raja Rao Rampa and Malaka, as well as memorializing forever the Raja's patronage of the arts and gentlemanly pursuits and Malaka's public power, beauty and artistic mastery. But Anup's treatise also shows the enduring power of the Mughals, and the court culture and knowledge they developed as a continuing source of symbolic authority throughout India, even as its power bled away. For those wanting to become the new Mughals in states like Hyderabad, what could give a nobleman greater cultural legitimacy than patronizing the music of the Mughal court, authenticated in the physical presence of a musician of the greatest imperial lineage, but made local in the extraordinary brilliance of that musician's Hyderabad-born protege, Malaka Bai Chanda. Finally, it is crucial testimony to the sheer intellectual virtuosity of this particular representative of the lineages of hereditary ustads that made their way all over India from the faltering Mughal court in Delhi. 
Ultimately, Hoshal wrote to prove his credentials as an authority to preserve his heritage from the losses of the scattering of Shah Jahanabad and to praise his new patrons and the joys he found in his new home. Fluent in the highest forms of Prajpasha verse and able to deploy with great subtlety several registers of Persian and a master performer and a beloved teacher into the bargain, Hoshal Khan Anup was the very opposite of the stereotype of the illiterate Ustad bequeathed to us by posterity. Thank you. Really well done, Catherine. That was a masterful narrative of, you know, this history. Um, and, you know, just as in your writing and your presentations, you just are such a good storyteller. Um, so it's it was really beautiful to listen to, um, and I think all of us are eagerly awaiting um, your book, um, and it will probably, it will for sure change a lot of things for our field, I think, uh, once it's out. Um, uh, I want to invite our audience to type their questions in um, the chat box, um, and we will get to them um, in in sort of in due course, but sort of as a as a warm up question, <laughs> um, I will take uh, the liberty to ask a first one. Um, you know, the story of Malaka and um, Khushal is such a micro story that you're able to get such really vivid glimpses into their lives, um, and so I want to know what you as both a music historian and a historian more broadly, you know, how does, how did the very specific things that you're able to take out of this narrative, how, what are their implications for earlier periods? Or what are their implications for, you know, understanding the transmission of musical knowledge more broadly? One of the things that you said that I thought was so beautiful and, you know, we take it for granted is, you know, Malaka and, um, and Kushal migrated with this, or, or their, their parents migrated with this musical knowledge in their bodies, you know, and that, that was really quite striking because I think it's something that's quite important for earlier periods as well. So that's just a question for you and you can answer it as, as, as you wish. Yeah. Thank you so much. It was a, what a, a lovely question, and 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 thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed presenting this material uh, this afternoon. Um, so yeah, one of the so I, I I've worked on earlier periods um, in, in 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 previous lives, um, and um, and one of the sheer joys about working on the 18th and 19th centuries is is that not only do we have actually quite detailed um stories about musicians and their lives but we also have paintings of them so you know for the first time you get uh paintings of sadarang and adarang and 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 karim khan here and malakabai and then named and so forth and before this time period um you do get some uh portraits of named uh, performers, particularly Tan Sen. We all know what Tan Sen looked like because there's old portraits of him. Um, uh, but uh, but before this time, you, you, you get a great deal less information. So it's actually a joy working uh, in this time period. Um, one of the um, one of the um, important takeaways, though, from uh, earlier material is that um, uh, literate ustads um, actually um, go back quite a long way. Um, so there, um, there are rumors that Pan Sen himself composed um, a a music treatise, um, though we we don't have it uh, extant. Um, although there is there is a there is a Persian translation of of his, his purported book Prakash, but. Um, but I actually don't, it's, it's, it reads a 17th century to me. I don't think it's a 16th century text. Um, but if we look at um, his great, 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 great grandson, Rasparas Khan Kalavant, who was writing in 1698, um, he is writing, um, uh, he's writing a translation of the Sanskrit treatise, uh, the Sankita Darpana, 
Um, and he doesn't include very much information about his own self, um, but he does include quite a bit of information about his father, Khushal Khan Gunasamudra. So 17th century Khushal Khan, not 18th century Khushal Khan. Um, and um, so we do get some information there, but it's also a really quite a remarkable treatise because um, he also includes quite a bit of knowledge that is clearly embodied oral knowledge because it's not coming from the Sankita Darpana. It's completely different. It's completely different lineage. And we know, you know, his own lineage, direct father to son from Tan Sen. So, so it's, it's clearly coming from there. But there's also another treatise which was written in 1666 by a Mughal nobleman called Mirza Roshan Zamir who was, again, Khushal Khan Gunasamudra, 17th century Khushal Khan's Shagit. So he was his disciple. And um, this is an incredibly fine translation of a Hobala Sangita Parijata, a uh, Sanskrit treatise, where he does a line by line, shloka by shloka, literal translation. And then he does a paraphrase translation and then he does a commentary and then he includes a doha in hindavi which sounds to me like mnemonics that he's been taught orally by khushal khan his ustad so you actually get some of this embodied knowledge in that material which is really amazing um but yes i mean that's 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 probably that's probably an, uh, an enough of an answer just just to say that it's you know the closer you get to the, you know, sort of 19th century, uh, the more stories about actual musicians and the more paintings of them and so on that we have, thankfully. Yeah. Now the questions are rolling in. There's, there are lots of words of congratulations to you, and which I will re-echo. Um, I think one of the strands of questions that Renu Parikh and Anapurna Garimala have asked is about a Gharana in, um, in Hyderabad? Is yeah. there a sense of it being established or um, is it, you know, simply a peripheral one to the North Indian one? Or how does that, how does that play out um, in terms of this narrative that you've cast for us? Yeah, this is a really, really good question. Um, and, um, and I have to say that um, my, my primary focus of research has not before being Hyderabad, this is actually the only work I've done in Hyderabad. So um, Khoshal Khan Anup did have a uh, a son or disciple called Ghazi Khan, who does appear in this treatise, um, and who, you know, I guess would have been born in the late 18th century, so probably, you know, sort of lived through to the 1850s. Um, and of course, you know, the, the great Tanras Khan of um, the Qawal Bache Karana in Delhi also comes down to Hyderabad um, uh, after the uprising. Um, uh, what I don't know is, is what happened to the descendants of Ghazi Khan um, and, and, and at um, the, the, in, in Nizami Hyderabad. Um, and that would be an amazing piece of research for somebody to do, um, especially as we have the Arbabi Nishat records for Nizami Hyderabad from the late 19th century. So um, they're in... Um, they're in the state archives. Um, they're in absolutely horrible Shikasta, <laughs> but they're in Urdu. Um, yeah. so anybody with a you know who's who's, who's good with with Shikasta uh, script, um, the the records are there. Um, and of course, you know there are genealogies of of um, of Hindustani musicians in Hyderabad. Um, so so it would be really fantastic for somebody to do that work and 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 connect those things. Um, so I wanted to also collect a couple of questions to ask you about languages. Um, so, you know, there's a question about Telugu, there's a question about Dakani. Um, also in your, you know, I think one of the really amazing things about this, what, what, what you presented to us today is that there's so many, um, hidden implications between the lines about language and language use. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought that, you know, 
maybe you might want to take the opportunity to sort of explain some of the issues with how multilingual this society was and how fluidly they may have moved between languages. The yeah. final, um, this final observation that you made that um, the, um, the, his retranslation um, from Braj to Persian was a completely different text. That's just so, it, it's so amazing to see how steeped in this kind of multilingual society they are. So yeah. if you have any um, thoughts or ideas or uh, about this yeah idea. so these I mean these are fantastic questions and 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 again I think this is something that that needs to be subject to to further research so we so we know that we know that Malakabai um uh operated primarily in uh registers of of North Indian vernacular so in in uh British Pasha and in and in what was then called Rechta of course Urdu um and um and and Dakni and and North Indian Odu being very very closely related to each other. Um, there are actually um, music treatises in Dakni that go back to the 16th century. Uh, one of which there are the remains of which remain in the uh, the British Library as kind of part of a um, a codex um, that reused the images on one side but maintained the Dakni text on the other in a Persian retranslation of the Dakni translation of the Sanskrit Sankita Ranakara, um, which is which is an, an absolutely amazing text and it actually has been digitized by the British Library. It's called the Jawahir al Muzakati Muhammadi. Um, but um, but what we do know is that there were, were a large number of, of Telugu speaking uh, courtesans and uh, male singers and performers at the Hyderabad court and um, again I haven't done this research but I'm assuming that they would have been performing in the same parties as North Indian performers um, and that they would have been intermingling and certainly accompanists um, would have been playing for, for, for both groups of, of people. Um, one thing that is, is really clear about musicians is that they were incredibly versatile um, across languages, um, uh, including by the 19th century courtesan singing in English. <laughs> 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 which must have been entertaining um, for, for everybody involved. Um, uh, but um, but uh, so the, you know, the, the, the practice of, of, you know, sort of, you know, holding a, um, a performance of song, which included uh, uh, people singing in, in Telugu, people singing in Urdu, people singing in Prajapasha, people singing in Persian, Persian still being, you know, widely sung across India uh, well into this period, well into the 19th century. In fact, it's, it doesn't, um, it's still the official language of the East India Company until 1837. Um, yeah, I, what, is, what is so clear from your project is that you are just swimming in sources and this is, <laughs> <laughs> there's so, such a large need for more brightly students to join yeah. <laughs> the ranks and 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 sort of start and to work on this material there yeah. is really a wealth of sources um that yeah. should and, be and up. especially in Hyderabad so you yeah. know I really encourage anybody who is is based in in Hyderabad or near Hyderabad to to really investigate these sources they're really they're really quite accessible um yeah yeah and it's not only sources, it's also questions, the kinds of questions that you can ask of them. So yeah. one of the questions that just appeared by K. J. Raj was, is what was art and dance restricted to the elite? Um, uh, uh, or did it move or was it widespread? Did it have a broad based participation? This is a question that I'm sure needs more yeah. research, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and um and the answer is is no, of course not. Everybody had everybody had music. Um uh, the, the the question is, is what types of music did they have? So there's there, so there 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 is a, a hierarchy of, of repertoire. I mean it's quite obvious that uh you know from the 17th century onwards, what was deemed to be a acceptable for elite man, men to listen to um, in an aesthetic environment, you know, in a, a courtly majlis or mefil was quite different from the music that they might enjoy in the bazaar, for example. So they're perfectly allowed to watch the acrobats um, and, and to, to fancy the, the, uh, the, uh, the 
courtesans and the and the dancing boys in, you know in the sort of slightly more vulgar uh bizarre entertainments and i use vulgar um uh deliberately because they regarded they called these entertainments vulgar <laughs> So, um, but, but of course they were watching them and of course they were listening to them and 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 you know and in some cases some of these this this repertoire actually did enter the courts when people were being a little bit naughty um but also you know these are really commonly enjoyed by you know all sorts of uh people and i think the uh, you know my my next kind of um I, I really want to do a much much larger um project on song and particularly looking at the ghazal um, in its many languages, um, as a kind of the kind of song genre that everybody sings and everybody knows something of. And if you look at the prisoner of war recordings that were made in Germany in 1915 by the Berlin Phonogram Archiv, oh. um, which are available at Humboldt University now, um, you have ordinary soldiers, ordinary Indian soldiers singing ghazals and they these these men are probably illiterate um or maybe they're not but but um but there's but they're the the ghazal kind of is is one of these song genres that kind of transcends all classes yeah. um which is fascinating and and it's definitely something that requires more research for sure so I wanted to take the opportunity to plug uh, Dr. Schofield's podcasts. Um, if you're interested in learning more, um, they're available on iTunes and there's a fantastic blog on the British Library blogs um, that go along with them. And these are certainly sort of gateway drugs to learning more about in the sunny classical music for um, a broader public. Um, so um, that's one thing, that's a one resource out there for some of our public audience, especially in India. Um, and um, the other thing is I will close with one final question that is um, quite a sweet question is uh, from Renu Park that asks, have you learned Hindustani music? Your insights into rag and raganis are amazing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, yes, I did. So, so I, I myself have haven't studied. Um, I so I I studied um, real for five years while I was doing my PhD, which is like saying I did grade one violin. Um, so you know, it's, I I wouldn't dare sing in public. Um, and and I've kept up my my interest in in rag and learning more about rag through uh, through listening. So um, so I I felt that because I was doing a historical project for my PhD twenty years ago, um, that it was very very important for me as a musician. So I trained as a violin and viola player. That um, I went to conservatoire. So that's that's my background as as a musician and i sang jazz and folk music and stuff um i felt that it was really important to get inside the rag and and really understand from the inside how the rags work and so i deliberately learned in the traditional manner um without any notation without any recording uh purely singing back to my ostad what he sang to me um, and that was rev was a revelatory practice for me, um, and I'm hoping to go back and, and do that because I'm I, I'm now embarking on a, a a kind of a I don't know if we, I don't even know if I want to call it a project, but I'm going to learn to sing the Persian and the Urdu Ghazal. So that's my yeah that's what I'm going to be doing when uh, I finish uh, the book. <laughs> uh, I think um, it's. Suffice it to say that uh, this is really a magisterial project and it was really a beautiful lecture. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this. Um, so please join me in thanking um, Dr. Catherine Butler Schofield for her fantastic lecture. Um, and we look forward to more research as it comes out at a trickle pace. <laughs> um, and and um, our next event, um, will be on May 20th and we are going back in time um, and it, it the title is the Vira Sheva's Lingayats of 12th century Karnataka conflict transformation and the genesis of a new creed and it will be delivered by Tiziana Lorenzetti um, from the um, International Institute of South Asian Studies in Rome um, on May 20th at 1 p.m so we'll see you in a couple of weeks 
Um, this lecture sort of goes together with the lecture the following week by Professor Julia A.B. Hegewald um, on reflections of Jaina and Virasheva interactions in the art and architecture of Karnataka. Um, so we really enjoy seeing our audiences and the continuity from uh, you know, from looking at later material, more Islamicate material to Hindu and Jain material. So it's, it's great that a lot of you show up for both of those lectures. So, um, so see you soon and thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Schofield. Bye.